Well, good morning. That's a beautiful day, isn't it? It's good to be here to worship God and uh, hope that you're excited uh, to be here, to come before God on this uh, Sabbath day and just remembering that he is our creator, remembering that he is our salvation. He's the God that brought us out of darkness to know the truth in light. And that light was Jesus Christ. And that light is Jesus Christ, the one in whom we live and move and have our being. He is the one who came as a light to the nations, and he is a light to us today, to keep looking at him and to see that in him we have salvation from the things of this world and the things that hold us into captivity. Now, last week when we were talking, we, we talked about the time of conquest. One of the most interesting things that happens when God freed his people from Egypt, and he brought the Israelites out of Egypt, he offered them this land. He said, this is going to be the land you're going to go to possess. Well, what's very interesting, and maybe not the way we would think, is in that land, there were enemies occupying all of its territory. It's a kind of an interesting thing when you're given something, but yet somebody else has that right now, isn't it? Remember he, Joshua, or excuse me, Moses uh, sent Joshua, Caleb, and others in to spy out the land? They said, this land is awesome. There's these beautiful homes Beautiful vineyards, all these great fields, all these wells, everything you would ever want to have. But it's occupied by these people. They're huge. They're giants. They're strong nations. They're all greater and mightier. And do you know what God testified? He said, you're right. They are all stronger and greater and mightier than you are. He didn't dispute that. But yet he was unhappy with the spies because... They came back with a report that was bad, saying, how can we do this when they're greater and mightier and stronger than we are? But yet Joshua and Caleb were of a different heart. And when they saw the land, they saw what God was giving them. And when they saw the enemy, they said, well, who are they compared to God? The God that opened the Red Sea, the God that already crushed all the Egyptians. Didn't we already see what our God can do? And that in life is much of how we win the battle, is to see the battle is not what we have to overcome, but seeing who God is and how God overcomes the battle. Overcoming sin, overcoming flesh, overcoming in this world is an issue of faith in God and seeing who God is greater than the problems that we have in life. So here we saw the nation that were filling the land, and that was what they had to overtake. We saw as time went on, they started filling parts of the land, but, but not fully possessing it. But we talked about the rules that God gave them. Rules that he said, when you go into the land, this is what I want you to do. And when we look at that land, that land is not just a promised land that was offered to the Israelites. That land begins with who you are. Who you are as a person. When God called you out to give you back yourself, when you became the holy possession of God, this was the land he wants you to inhabit. To not make compromises with your enemies. To not soften your heart towards your enemies. To not play with them lest they lead you astray. We talked about how it is, how sin often creeps in. It doesn't happen all at once. It usually starts slowly. Now, if you would resurrect somebody from 150 years ago in this country and put them in this nation today, they would be shocked by what they saw. They couldn't believe what was going on in our country. But, you know, it didn't jump from, you know, 18, late 1800s to where it is here today in the early 2000s. It didn't jump there. It slid. And there's a sliding that takes place, and the sliding takes place when you compromise, when you have a softening in your heart. And God basically says, this is how you're going to go astray. Because you're making treaties with the enemy, and you can't make treaties with your enemies. You have to have a wholeheartedness unto the Lord. That is what he desires. And so he said, when you go in, well, I might need some help. This isn't working. Oh, there we go. Break down the altars. Uh, can you help me up there? Just all the way through those. Thank you. Break down the altars, shatter their sacred pillars, cut down the poles, burn the idols. In other words, you've got to get rid of all of it. You've got to get rid of all of it. If you're going to try to leave things that are ungodly in your life, 
then you're saying, I'm leaving myself open to my enemy to grow into other spots, to grow into my life. You have to take that attitude when you've recognized the enemy. Now, if you could go ahead and switch to the next slide, please. Thank you. Turn with me over to the book of Exodus. We read these same kind of verses here in Deuteronomy last week, but notice here in Exodus chapter 23, Exodus chapter 23, when God's talking about sending the people into the promised land, he says this in Exodus chapter 23. He says here in verse 27, Exodus 23, verse 27, I will send my fear before you. I will cause confusion among the people to whom you come and will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, the Hittite from before you. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. I want you to really think about that last verse because that's what we're going to really be talking about today. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and inherit the land. God wants you to be increasing so that you can actually be a possessor of the promised land. You see, he's saying that the beast would be overrun. Well, think about this. What if God had looked at that map and all those nations, he said, all these nations are greater and mightier. If he would have just gone in and himself just wiped them all out, just, just destroyed all of them, which he said, I could do all this. He just wipes them all out and the land is barren. What happens to the land? Let me ask you this. If, if we as the United States go into let's say, Iraq and we just wipe it clean, what do you think happens in that area? Do you think the other nations around there might enter in, take it over? Whenever there's a vacuum in the world, it gets filled by some power. And the reality is that just cleansing us from the enemy is not what is needed to possess the land. There has to be a rulership of God in the land. Otherwise, another enemy just comes in. We talked about the principle last week. It says that if there's an unclean spirit in a person and that unclean spirit goes out and it wanders around and it's looking for a place to dwell, it will take seven other spirits even more wicked and go back to that place that was swept clean. What is it that causes that place to be a stronghold for the Lord? It's because not only when the unclean spirit goes out is it cleansed, but the spirit of the Lord comes in. The Spirit of God makes the difference. In our lives, what we are looking to do is increase in the Lord, that Jesus Christ becomes greater and greater in our lives, that His rulership and His reign is what's occupying our spaces. The spaces of our time, the way we think, the way we go to work, what we do with our lives, to have God occupying it. Do you want God to occupy your life? Why are you here? Why are you here? Why are you alive? You know, I, I know it's hard for young people sometimes to ask this question because everything's very immediate in life. Sometimes for us adults, it's very immediate too. We make immediate choices. But great wisdom is to ask a simple question. Why am I even here? Why do I exist? Why do I have life and breath? Because if you ask yourself that question, you will start to be different unto the one who made you and gave you that life. See, the world is designed by your enemies to keep you from asking that question, to keep you from realizing the purpose and the plan for your existence on the earth. And if the evil one and your enemy can keep you blinded from why you're even here existing on the earth, he can keep you from being the person God made you to be. Because as much as God could have gone in and driven out all the enemies, as much as God can come in and wipe out all sin in our lives, he is wanting our cooperation and our voluntary service to him in it. He's wanting to build a fellowship with us, 
a fellowship by which we agree. When God says, you shall have no other gods before me, we say, yes, God, we will have no other gods before you. When the Lord says, you shall not murder, we say, no, we will not murder, because the Lord says no. When he says, do not commit adultery, do not commit sexual immorality, we say, no, we don't want that. He says, no drunkenness, no. Our hearts align with him, and in that we have fellowship that is based on his word, which is based on a rule of law, which is perfect love. See, the blindness and deception is that God's law isn't meant for you because he loves you. It is absolutely meant because he loves you. Because God doesn't just see today. God doesn't see the fun of the moment alone. What he sees is the future. Who are you? And why are you here? So you can play all the games of life, but you're not going to be who God made you to be. All you're doing is short-circuiting the reason you're here. And the enemies of the Lord, the reason he said, when you go in, cut them all off, he's saying, I don't want them to short-circuit you. And the reality is, as we read through the book of Joshua and we come into the book of Judges, you know what's so sad is that Joshua is saying, you guys, why were you making covenants with all these nations? And God said, I'm going to turn them back over. I'm going to make it the way it's going to be. If you want to leave them around, they're going to be a constant thorn in your side. And isn't that what sin is? Sin is just a constant thorn in your side. We trick ourselves into thinking it's fun, it's pleasurable, it somehow brings some reward, but the reality is it's just a thorn. It's just something that hurts. It's something that brings us down. But God wants us to increase. God wants us to grow, to leave that past behind. Turn with me over to the book of 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. God wants us to be steadfast in his ways and know that there is a right way to live, a godly way. But notice what he says here in 2 Peter chapter 3. He says, You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the air of the wicked. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. To grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you see that? Do you see the contrast? Don't be led away with the air of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's the antidote. There's the change. There's the transformation process that God has. Turn with me now to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1 picks up at the time after Moses had died, after he'd been leading the people through the wilderness, he brought them out of Egypt. They come to this point that Moses is dead. Joshua, who had Moses lay hands on him, is now leading the people. And so it says here in verse 1, So after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn uh, from it to the right hand or the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth 
but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have not I commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now just think about what God is expressing here to Joshua. The leadership he has and that God has put on him to take this land, knowing there's giants in the land, knowing there's nations there, knowing there's these walled strongholds, and how does a nation go up to fight against them when they know they're not as strong? And God is saying, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Remember last week when we were going through Deuteronomy 7, God says, I am delivering these nations to you. I'm the one who's delivering, but you go, and this is what I want you to do as you go. But it was God's deliverance. And see, part of the problem that we face as Christians is sometimes we think that it's not God's deliverance. We think somehow we got to change ourselves. The reality is we need to look to God in heaven to make the difference in our lives that comes out as his grace comes upon us. Now, when I said we need to grow in the grace and knowledge, God's grace is what makes the difference. God's grace and power in our lives is what saves us to transform us to be the people that God made us to be. Notice this again, what he says, be strong and of good courage. Three times he's telling them, be strong and of good courage. I want you to think about that in your own life. What is God saying to you and me here today? We're going to face things that are bigger than us. We're going to say to ourselves, how can I overcome that? How can I be victorious in this? Whether it's personal things we're fighting in our own lives, if we're trying to overcome sin, whether it's things in our work, in the workplace, if it's things in our community, things in church, things in society. When we go after and start battling, if we're looking at the problem, we're going to be defeated. It's God that's saying, be strong and courageous. Why? Because what you're facing is bigger than you. What you're facing is stronger and mightier than you. And if you're measuring yourself against the problem, you're going to fall short. The transformation process takes place by us learning to allow Jesus to increase in us. Because where Christ is, there is all victory. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Do you believe that? Do you believe in him? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you accept him in? Do you invite him into the battles in your life to give you the victories? That's why he's saying be strong and courageous. Because what it looks like in this world and to this world, if you measure it according to reason, it doesn't make sense. If you look at this world and how strong the world is in evil and turning away from the Lord, it doesn't make sense that we could ever be victorious. But is God greater? Is God stronger? Is God strong enough for you to deliver you from iniquity and deliver you to his holy righteousness? The transformation comes from God. Your responsibility and my responsibility is to believe this is the work of God that you would believe in him who the father sent this is the work of God to put our attention onto God almighty for what he would do in our lives turn with me now to Joshua one more thing here before we leave Joshua 1 I also want you to notice how he repeated to say I will never leave you or forsake you, and he says, the Lord will be with you wherever you go. Those are the words of comfort, that in battle, you know you can make it, because you know you have God with you and on your side. Turn with me now to uh, chapter 5 of Joshua, Joshua 5. Notice here in verse 13. So this is when they had entered into the land, and the first place they came up against was Jericho. Jericho was a huge stronghold. It was a walled city, walled all the way around. It was fortified, and basically, it wasn't going down. It was a stronghold. The way man would look at it, you wouldn't want to go against this. You know, in the, in the book, The Art of War, Sun Tzu said that the last thing you ever want to do in warfare and in conflict 
is attack a stronghold. He said only if you absolutely have to do it. Because when you attack a stronghold, you're basically saying we're going to suffer a lot of casualties. People die because you come up against the walls, there's arrows coming down, there's boulders coming down, there's hot oil, all kinds of things that they do to destroy armies that come to break a stronghold. And so he said that's the last thing you want to do. It's, it's a poor use of resources to try to break down a stronghold. But here are the Israelites up against the stronghold of Jericho. And it comes to pass, notice in verse 13, when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite of him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No. No. Are you for us or our adversaries? No. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Now again, I want you to think about that in terms of the battles that we fight for possession of our own lives apart from sin and the battles that we go through in this life. When the commander shows up with his sword drawn, he is there as the commander of the army of the Lord to do God's will. And what brought this about? Joshua goes into the land that he is to possess. He is there ready to begin. But it was the commander showing up that makes the difference. He said, I, as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. So often in life, we, we identify enemies. We identify problems. We figure out there's things that are wrong in our heart or in our mind, the way we are living our lives that, that, that we know need to be conquered. And what we do is we develop a plan that we can reason out, that we can intellect out, that we can go about, that seems logical, that seems like it should work. If I can only discipline myself in these manners, I will change. How many of you have ever tried that? How many of you have ever tried that and failed? Big time. Because discipline only goes so far. Your, the strength of your flesh can only do so much. And the reality is that generally what you're fighting against is bigger and stronger than you are. Brethren, we do not wrestle with flesh and blood. Notice with me here in, in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. In other words, be strong and courageous, but in him be strong and courageous. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Notice Ephesians 6, verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. That's why we're defeated. Because we think that we need to change our flesh. And what we don't realize is we're not battling the flesh. We're battling this spiritual wickedness. Everything about the spiritual wickedness that we face, whether it's of ourselves, of society, of Satan, of the demons, notice this again. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against spiritual, excuse me, against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness, in the heavenly places. You think about that, it changes the game, doesn't it? Because now it's not a matter of discipline. What you realize is you have enemies that want to trip you up, that want to keep you from becoming the person God made you to be. Here's how it works. I'm not going to get drunk anymore. I'm going to stop drinking. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stop doing this, I'm not going to go with those friends anymore. I'm not going to be around alcohol. I'm going to lock the doors. I'm going to do all these things. And we can set up all these fleshly parameters that are going to stop us from drinking, that are going to stop us from getting drunk. And you can set all that up. 
But one day, you're going to be going through something in your life that's going to put you in the right circumstance. You've had a rough day at work. You're under a lot of stress at school. Things are happening in your life. Maybe you're just feeling so good about yourself or maybe something in your flesh. You're, just, you're rising up, you're puffing up, and the opportunity, either because of hurts or because of supposed victories, are going to lay themselves out for you. Have it. All your discipline goes right away. The reality is it, it'll get pushed in front of you at the right times. Because the devil is like a roaring lion going about seeking whom he may devour to say, this is the time when I want you to do this. Even when Jesus was tempted, remember what it says, that after Jesus defeated Satan on the mount, it said that the devil left him for a season. Not the rest of time, just for that time. Because it's in the times that you're strong that he's willing to walk away and say, no, I'll just wait. Because I know you'll be weak, and there it is. That's when I'll put it before you. That's why our flesh runs short. Because we give in in our own weakness. But what we're asked to do in verse 10 here is be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Jesus said, I will not leave you or forsake you. I will be with you. This is where the walk of faith happens. In your day-to-day -day experiences, to know that God is with you and that you want him increasing in the areas of your life that can bring you down. But notice verse 15 again. Now back to Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5 and verse 15. So the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. So now again, Joshua sees the Lord, says a sword is drawn in his hand, right? So he had to be thinking that here's the Lord, the commander of the armies, ready, and he appears there before Joshua. And you're thinking, okay, we're getting ready to go to battle. We're going to go fight. Sword is drawn. What is the first thing that Joshua needs to do? Take off your sandals. Humble yourself. This is holy ground. You see, when we come into battle against sin, against the enemies, against the principalities and the powers, our strength is found in our humility before God to realize he is the holy God. We take off our sandals and we say, I need you. I need your help, God. See, we can go out there swinging a sword. We can go out there fighting our own battles. But can we really overcome? And the reality is, if you haven't been trying, just try. Because you'll see, in the flesh, you always end up falling short. You can build a false religion. You can build a religion of practices that are very fleshly. But it won't necessarily produce the character of love, of peace, of patience, of the kindness and generosity of spirit that God wants you to have. You can become very disciplined. And some of us have more discipline than others. But discipline isn't conversion. It's just discipline. The discipline we need is the one that comes from God when we see it the way God sees it, and then we can look and say, no, not interesting. I do not want that. You know, there's a, uh, a sin that pervades our society. I think it has since time began. It's a, it's a sin that uh, is of uh, lust, lust of women. Pornographic sites, pornographic magazines, Pornography is just, it's an extremely widespread problem. And you know that it is because you can tap into it almost anywhere you go. And lots of people do it, and lots of people make money off of it. There was a study done in, in 2009 and 2010. It said that 13% of all web searches were for sexually erotic content. I mean, when you really think about that, that's amazing. I, I, I personally have never done a search like that. But I mean, I search the internet multiple times a day. So you think of 13% of, 
13%. It, it, I mean, that's, that's crazy because of all the things you could look at for weather, right? News, uh, you know, different information that you look at. The things we look up, like I don't know what that means or I don't know what the definition of that word is. I mean, all the things that you go in the course of business, I look up for produce distributors and companies and I'm looking for products and I do web searches throughout the day for my business. To think if I said 13% of my site searches, that would be multiple times a day for me. Because I probably do somewhere, you know, at least 50 web searches a day. So you think about 13%. Think about what that means in real numbers and the amount of searches that go on. And just the number, there's over uh, 42,000 pornographic websites that are in the top 1 million uh, of websites. And there's about 650 million websites. So just in the top 1 million of the most frequent sites, about 42,000 of those are pornographic. Now, I bring this one up because I think it's plain to see. And throughout the scriptures, it's very open. God says, if, if you lust after another woman, you've already committed adultery in the heart. doesn't matter if you've actually had sexual intercourse. That's not the point. The point is, if you're looking at her the wrong way, you've already committed adultery in your heart. You've already sinned. You're already in trouble. But when you look at that sin, and you say, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it, the victory can't be found in the flesh. Does flesh ever defeat flesh? Can what you've begun in the spirit now be perfected in the flesh? No. So when you find a sin like this in your life, when you come up against a Jericho like lust, you have to ask God for wisdom and help. How do I defeat this enemy? Help me see this enemy. Now in Joshua's time here, the first thing God said was, take off your sandals, humble yourselves. But then notice what he says, verse 1 of chapter 6. So Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. In other words, we're holding down the fort. We know you're here to take us down, but we're buckling in. We're getting stronger and saying we're, we're not giving up this ground. So the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. Would that plan work? So you're going to march around the city, six days, you're going to blow trumpet, but on the, you're going to be quiet, and then on the seventh day, you're going to march around seven times, you're going to blow the trumpet, shout, and that's it? The walls are going to come down? It sounds crazy, doesn't it? It doesn't sound rational. It doesn't sound logical. It's certainly not the way our flesh would design a victory in war. Right? Do you understand the point? That if you're trying to design it logically in the flesh with your intellect, you might just be wasting your time. Now, maybe not. God can bless things that we reason out and plans, but in this plan... What Joshua had to do was humble himself before the commander of the army, the Lord God, and then the Lord told him what to do, and that would bring him success. And see, what we read about in the rest of this chapter is they did exactly what he said, and when they blew the trumpet and they shouted on that seventh day, the walls fell flat, and they went in and completely overran that stronghold and destroyed it. Jericho did not exist. They burned it down to the ground, everything that was in it. The only things they took were the precious things that God told them to take. But every man, woman, child, old, beast, pet, everything was destroyed. Because God did not have them make any compromise with anything that was in that stronghold. 
Now you realize all that's a lesson for us of following God. So I bring it to you again. I brought up the, the sin of lust because it's one of those sins that's common to mankind but that God does give plans of how to settle it in your mind. I want you to think about the way God would view pornography. I want you to think about the way God would have you look at that woman. How does God see a woman who takes off her clothes and poses herself for a picture for the purpose of inciting something evil in someone else. If God is looking at this and saying, you know, here's what I did from the beginning. God's picture was this. I'm creating a man. I'm creating a woman. And what I want them to do is I want them to be joined together in a union of fidelity, of faithfulness and loyalty to one another. One man and one woman. And I want those two to join together so much that now the two become one. And in that oneness, they're going to be fruitful and multiply and have children. This was God's perfect plan from the beginning. What man has done is said, no, we want to rip that apart, not one man and one woman. Sometimes we'll stick a man in the woman's place or a woman in the man's place. Sometimes we're going to have uh, children with multiple families and multiple relationships. Sometimes we won't even get married. We'll just do it whichever way we want. If you would say... God created something perfect. It's written right in the book of Genesis for us, and man has done everything he can to pervert that perfect relationship, which was all about faithfulness and fidelity. The world has made it common. So now what do you think God's view is when he sees pornography? What do you think God's view is when he looks at someone who's doing that? Sorrow. It hurts his heart to see that someone he made in his image to be to the glory of God is debasing themselves into something so common and perverse. You see how horrific that is? The creator is saying, you're debasing yourself. That's not something to lust after. It's pathetic. It's sad. It's wrong. It's evil. What else do you think God thinks about that? It's idolatry. Why? Pornography and idolatry, right? Temple prostitution. What else? Covetousness. Why? You're lusting and desiring something not yours. It is meant to make you covet something that's not yours. Man, who are you to covet when it comes to females? Your wife. Whether you're married or not, the person you should be coveting is your own wife. Do you realize that's why fornication, that is sin of sexual immorality before marriage, is a sin because God wanted it set up in a perfect pattern that said, no, there's only one person you should commit yourself to, that is your wife. If you're sinning with someone else who's not your wife before you get married and you're having sexual relationships with them, what are you doing? You're being intimate with someone not your wife. Why are you doing that? Why are you whoring yourselves out? Don't you know what I created this to be? Something perfect and pure and honorable? And yet, there are magazines that are designed to get you to think about other people, not your wife, to get you to think about them in a way that is selfish and sexual and just all about the ego. Think about, really, what is being pulled at the heartstrings to make you go look at a website with pornography and keep you there. Look at it. Here's where the grace of God comes in. The grace of God is an invitation that you say, God, I accept your grace, and when God comes into your life, you start to see things the way he does. When he says grow in the grace and knowledge, you can't be looking at that and be looking at God at the same time. You can't be thinking about it the way God does and think about it in a wrong way. 
The reality is you have to say, God, I don't want your grace right now. I want you out of my life for the moment because I've got other things happening. Do you want to overcome sin in your life? Because whether it's this sin or just any of the others we can name, do you invite God in by humbling yourself and saying, show me the plan. Show me the way you see it. Show me the way you design it. Show me you, God. Do you want God in your heart and in your mind? Do you want him reigning and having rulership in the way that you think and go about living this life? Is there any place you don't want the Spirit of God dwelling in you? Is there any place you don't want him showing you how to live, leading you, guiding you, teaching you? Because, friends, the earnestness that we need to have in approaching God is to realize that in him there is all the power to overcome all sin, all destruction that is in this world. To be alive and to be free unto God, to worship and serve him continually. That's what the grace of God does. The grace of God is a life changer. Turn with me over to the book of 2 Corinthians, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians in chapter 15. Notice what Paul says here in verse 10. First Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10. But by the grace of God. What is grace? You know, the simplest definition that you can give, whether you're looking at grace in the Old Testament or the New Testament, is simply a word favor. Simply a word favor. But what does it mean to have God's favor? See, you need to think about what that means. If you only look at grace as favor, you miss out on the depth of it, that it can be explored through the scriptures and the way the scriptures actually define the way grace comes out, the fruit of grace in our lives. So look at this. By the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Do you say that about your life today? Could you make this testimony and say, I am who I am today because of God's grace? See, there's a, there's a conviction and there's a testimony that is given to God to say, I am what I am by grace. And notice... And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Grace. The grace of God. I want you to think about this just even in, in a human circumstance. What is it when you are favored by someone? When you, when you curry favor with someone? Like, if someone uh, works for me, they can curry favor with me, and it might mean, hey, Brad, how about we go to lunch? I'll treat. That, he gets favor sometimes, right? And he does that to me too, right? It's kind of a two-way street. But if I have favor, I might say, guys, I'm just, I'm so happy with the way things are going off. office. Boss's treat. We're going to go get lunch together. And so I can bless them in the way that I can bless them, in just a little way, Right? But as a human being alone, it's a very finite way for me to bless them. I can bless them with favor of uh, job opportunities and work circumstances and giving time off. I can bless them with uh, meals and bonuses and salary and raises. And I can bless them, but it's in a way that I can. The power I have to grant favor to someone is limited to certain things. How is God limited in his grace, in his favor? You see, I can give tools to make you better at your job. I'll give you an example. We used to do all these reports where we hand wrote down all these notes, and then we'd take the notes and we'd have to go back to the hotel and type up reports. It was a very long process. Brad and another employee of mine came in and said, hey, we could speed all this up and we could be better at what we're doing if we did it this way. We need iPads to go in. We need this better tool because we can do this. 
and then we'll take the pictures and we'll put it together and it'll cut down hours of our time doing the same thing. So, done. We're going to do the things that make sense because I want them to be the best employees they can be. Anything I can do to give them utilities, resources, knowledge, right, encouragement, abilities, functionality, things that they can have in their work. I want them to have that to be the best employee and the best person they can be as they go out to work. How much more God in heaven, who is a good God, give to us everything we need to be the people he wants us to be. Do you realize that's why God says, come and ask. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. But he says, but when I return, will I find faith on the earth? Will people continue to pray and seek me for gifts? Or will they just be living according to their own sight, logic, and reason? When you read those verses, I believe it's in Luke 18. Could be wrong about that. But when he talks about, will he find faith? For the woman keeps coming and praying to the unjust judge, give me deliverance, give me justice. And he finally does because of that. God says, if the unjust judge knows how to give her the things she asked for because she keeps coming lest he be weary, how much more a good God in heaven? When God favors us, what he does is he takes of his perfect presence and brings it into our lives and says, what do I need to do to make you the person that I created you to be? Do you realize what an awesome invitation God is giving us to say, I want to come in your life. I want to make you who you are to be, and I want to labor in you to do the things that I need you to do. Just like with Jericho. He says, I just want you to take these steps. I'm going to do what I need to do. I'm going to destroy Jericho, but I want you to come participate in the process. God did not destroy the nations in the promised land. He could have wiped them all out, and he did deliver them, but he wanted the children of Israel to go through the process with him because what he was concerned about doing was not just wiping out the peoples of the land. He was concerned about the development of the Israelites. And God is all about concern in you. Why is it important to preach the gospel? For those people's sakes, but your sake. You see, God's way of love is so perfect. Do you know how you become more like God? By doing the things God does that bless and affect other people. It's when you bless someone, you're changed. That's why Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Don't you see what's being worked out in you when you start living by the grace of God? It's God's grace, his power. God, come on us. Bless us with your spirit. Pour into us the power of your presence to change us. We need to be crying out in prayer all the time, asking God to keep coming in. Fill me, Lord. Fill me, God, that I would be filled with your glorious power, that it may go out to those around me. This mindset is the rulership that he wants for his land. It's apart from sin. It's so far from pornography. It's so far from the lust of the flesh because your life is now not thinking about how to please me and what I want and make me feel good. What you're realizing is I need to be thinking about everybody else. I need to be thinking about how can I help? How can I bless? It's stopping the selfishness. But it happens not by you with your flesh overcoming flesh it happens by the grace of God that is imputed by the blood of Christ and by faith. God gives us the grace and we see things the way he does. And what we're doing as we walk in this is saying, show me, God, how to see this situation. Help me see it like you do. Man, you see a woman walking across the street when you're sitting at a stoplight and you start to feel any thought of lust toward that woman, just say, God, come in. Show me how you see that woman right now. Show me how to think about her. Show me how to put my mind on her the way you do. God, bless her. Help her. Help her to be the woman you created her to be. You start praying for someone like that, that line of sinful thinking can't stand in the face of God's spirit. 
That's the point. God is greater than all the enemies you face. And it's amazing how the grace of God can take you from a place you were in in sin and remove you so far from it, you're like, that doesn't even interest me anymore. How many times have I confessed to this congregation about the amount of, of sinful uh, just dissipation of life that I had as a young man watching television? It appeals to me not at all. But it would have been like, what if I was doing cocaine instead of television? It's like seeing a powder of white dust. It's a mess that needs to be vacuumed up. It's nothing. It doesn't hold power. God wants to break the power of sin in your lives to set you free that his righteousness may reign in you wherever you go. That's what God desires. That's why he wanted the Israelites overtaking the promised land. His desire was, we're going to get rid of the idolatry. We're going to set up perfect and pure worship. Will you do that in your life for God? That's what we're inviting him to do. And he's saying, I want to do it. Notice again here, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Who do you want to be? Who has God made you to be? By his grace, you're going to become that. Loving, giving, giving. Serving, providing, helping. Think of who God made you to be. A protector, a watchman, righteous, true. Who do you want to be in Christ? Who does Christ want you to be in him? Are you on the same path of fellowship with God and allowing him to create that in you? By grace it will happen. His grace. And he says, I labored more abundantly Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. By grace, by grace, we have everything we need to labor. By grace, we have the motivation, we have the heart, and we have the gifts to give to someone else. You realize trying to minister to someone in the flesh will only get you so far. But when you minister by the Spirit of God in grace, you can change lives. See, this worship service is no good without God. Coming here is no good if God doesn't pour out his spirit upon us. Reading God's word without his spirit, it's just going to fall short. We need God in our lives. We need God to lead us and guide us. We need God to show us. And here's the beautiful thing. He says, I am with you when you are with me. I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to take you in my wings, and I'm going to show you the way to go. I'm going to bring you to where you need to be strong and courageous, but I'm going to fight the battle for you. I just want you to be there with me, assenting that you're fighting this battle, that we're fighting the battles together. Do you realize that God is looking to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him? Read it, 2 Corinthians 16, Chronicles 16, 2 Chronicles 16, 9. <laughs> One flesh, baby, it's the same sermon. <laughs> Thank you, honey. Turn with me over to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Notice here in verse 8. God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Just receive that. That's an awesome promise, isn't it? God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. That's a changed life for God. That's where God wants us to be. 
in seeking his spirit, in seeking a constant baptism of his spirit, of being immersed in God, that in everything that we're doing, in word or deed, we're doing in the name of Jesus Christ. When we get up in the morning, we're thinking about praising God and asking him, come into my life today, God. As we go to work, help me, bless me in the provisions. Give me all grace, right? So that as it says, that all grace, that we may have all sufficiency in all things. You think of the power that God is offering to us as we have faith and belief and come to him for grace. Bless me, God, in this work that I do. Bless me, God, in teaching my children. Bless me, God, in my marriage. Give me all grace for all sufficiency. Help me with them. All grace for all sufficiency. In the church, we're looking at all grace for all sufficiency. When we teach, all grace for all sufficiency. When we worship and praise, God grant us all grace for all sufficiency, that your work may abound in everything. God is so looking to bless you. We read in Joshua chapter 1, he said, Now be strong and courageous that you may follow all the words that are in this book of the law and do them so that your way may be prosperous and that you may be successful. Turn back there and notice that with me. Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. And again, notice in verse 8. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Do you want that in your life? Do you want to be prosperous and have good success? Do you want to be abounding in the work of the Lord? Do you want to have all sufficiency? It's by his grace. Because when God looks upon you with favor and blesses you, he comes into your life, and there's no limit to what he can give. There's no limit to how he can help. There's no limit to how he can bless. There's no limit to what he can do. God is not limited. We limit the Holy One of Israel. He is not limited. He wants to be alive and showing himself to be God on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. That is what we want to be doing here. We need to praise him and seek him and desire for him to fill our lives that his rulership and reign by grace would be what's taking over every aspect of our lives. Love him. Worship him. Serve him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what he's doing toward us. He gave everything for us that we could be the children of God. Don't let the enemies steal your inheritance. Don't compromise with them on the inheritance of your life that God is giving you. Don't make compromises with the enemy. Let God fill all the places of your heart and mind. Praise be to God.